Uh, good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues and friends. Uh, I'm glad to welcome you uh, at the webinar, Human Rights, Examples of International Solidarity. Uh, I would like to inform you that uh, English translation, uh, that we will hold this webinar in English, but Ukrainian translation available. Uh, you need to find on context menu of Zoom interpretation and uh, choose uh, Ukrainian language, and then you will uh, hear our translator, Sasha. Uh, Sasha, thank you a lot for translation. Uh, my name is Nazari Boyarsky, and today I will uh, be the moderator of this event. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this webinar is conducted by the Human Rights Vector NGO from Ukraine in partnership with the Word of Tolerance NGO Georgia and the Promolex NGO Moldova. In the framework of the, in the Search for Solidarity project, which support from Human Rights House Foundation and funded by the European Union. Uh, this webinar is a part of a series of online events dedicated to the history and modern state of affairs of human rights movement and solidarity in Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. Uh, next slide, please. And I also would like to inform you that it's uh, not our first uh, webinar on familiar topic, and previous year we uh, had plenty of webinars in uh, English and Ukrainian and Georgian language. But for all webinars, English uh, subtitles uh, is available. So uh, we invite you to join our YouTube uh, channel, uh, Vector Pravda Dini. Uh, you will find so soon in, in chat also a um, direct link. And enjoy uh, our webinars. Uh, I really hope and I think that you'll find a lot of interesting facts there and uh, food to your brain. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we will uh, spend the next uh, hour and a half together, so I would like to share some wishes to our joint work. Uh, if you have any technical problems, uh, please uh, try to restart connection uh, on your device or change internet source uh, or your device uh, which, you're sharing to join, uh, which you're using to join our webinar. Uh, if you would like to ask any special question, uh, please, uh, you can use uh, Zoom chat for this, and we will try to uh, answer you during the webinar or at the end of the webinar in a question and answer session. Uh, and also, I would like to warn you that we record uh, this webinar, but uh, only your only face of our speaker and mine and like common presentation will be visible on um, record. So uh, this like short uh, information for me. I would like also to know who are present today on our webinar. So you can uh, use our chat and introduce yourself. Uh, we'll be pleased to know uh, who are you, where are you from, what are you doing in your life. Please share this information in our chat. And um, now uh, we can close our, my presentation. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce our expert for our first webinar in uh, our project, uh, Sasha Dilimenchuk. Uh, Sasha Dinchuk also uh, opened a previous series of our webinars uh, previous year, so I hope it's good tradition. And previous uh, year, uh, Sasha, you talked with us about human rights, and today we invite you to talk about solidarity. And for me, solidarity is a topic which help uh, go through hard time. And uh, I, I, maybe you agree with me, maybe our participants will be agree with me that nowadays it's kind of hard time for human rights. So um, I would like to uh, ask you, Sasha, how solidarity can help for human rights? Please unmute. You, you already asked me to start the whole webinar or? Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. I, I thought it was a uh, tricky question in the beginning. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Sasha. 
Uh, I will say several words about myself, and in the meantime, I will encourage you to, to write in the chat who, who are you, with which topics you work, from which countries you are. I already mentioned one participant from Kyrgyzstan, and it was really encouraging that people are following us not only from the project target countries, but also beyond, and this shows us the real solidarity. So guys, please feel free to write in the chat um, about uh, who you are, from which country, what is your kind of field of work, like whether you're a student or activist or educator or um, uh, some uh, or just interested person. Um, during this uh, time, I will also say about who am I. Uh, I work in the field of human rights uh, during the last 17 years. Uh, and uh, actually my field of work always was uh, solidarity work in human rights. Nevertheless, uh, I'm originally from Ukraine, but uh, I work um, uh, mostly for two, in two countries, it's Ukraine and Georgia. And also I work all over post-Soviet Union area. Uh, I have a lot of projects in Central Asia, uh, in um, Western CSI and in other regions of former Soviet area, but not only. Uh, I also used to be part of the um, a global uh, course on human rights uh, and um, support and support to resilience of human rights defenders, uh, which is um, uh, which is uh, the Hague course for human rights. So for five years, uh, we were gathering human rights defenders from all over the world, including Latin America, Southeast Asia, uh, Africa, Europe, um, and um, other areas of the world uh, to teach uh, um, mutually teach ourselves uh, human rights, solidarity, and resilience. If uh, I return to some formal things, uh, now I work as uh, head of the project Tbilisi Shelter City. This is also a solidarity project. Um, it works from 2016 and since then it provided support uh, to more than 200 uh, human rights defenders uh, at risk, who were at risk of uh, criminal prosecution, physical assassination, uh, of, uh, professional burning out, and we were accepting these uh, people in the um, uh, safe spaces in order for them to have a short break from the risking conditions uh, in which these human rights defenders and civic activists work. Uh, also before this, in 2014, me and Nazar, we were together involved in other solidarity initiative, Euromaidan SOS in Ukraine, uh, which was supporting um, uh, participants of the peaceful protest in Ukraine, which later was called Revolution of Dignity, and we were providing for them legal support. Uh, legal um, um, advice and referring them to other different initiatives which were providing uh, psychological support, medical support, uh, etc. And Euromaidan SOS was one of the largest uh, volunteer initiatives during the Revolution of Dignity. And recently it again renovated it, uh, its activities. Unfortunately, due to very um, tragic conditions, um, uh, due to the full fledged, full scale um, aggression of Russia uh, and war of Russia, uh, aggressive war of Russia against Ukraine. Um, are you like, uh, if, if you would, if you would need, you, you can search me on Facebook and you can see a lot of my other affiliations. I used to work with a lot of our international organizations such as OEC, such as uh, Global Fund for Women, um, uh, such as um, um, uh, some uh, like frontline defenders uh, initiatives, initiatives and some other initiatives. Also, I used to work with a lot of organizations in Ukraine, uh, like Ukrainian Health and Human Rights Union, Center for Civil Liberties, and some others. But now I'm more or less settled in Belize Shelter City, working for resilience and rehabilitation of human rights defenders, and also working a lot with different educational activities. Uh, so I will also have a brief look. At, at the chat, and it's so nice to see a lot of people uh, who are from different different countries and backgrounds and cities. I can see here people from Kyrgyzstan, from uh, Zaporizhia, Ukraine, from Nikolaev, Ukraine, from Kiev, Ukraine, uh, from um, again. Uh, 
from Sumi Ukraine. Uh, so, but but there is several several inputs in the chat, and we are thirty two people. Uh, so let's uh, other people let's encourage other people also to write in the chat. But as far as we need to start, we will do it. Uh, so how we will build our webinar today? Uh, we will have two parts. We, uh, as far as our webinar today is to, is uh, dedicated to the issues of solidarity in relation to the human rights. Uh, we will um, like you know that human rights is a concept which shows connection uh, between uh, uh, personality, between individual and state. Uh, and human rights is a kind of umbrella which is protecting individual uh, from the um, misusage of state power by the state. So that's why uh, we'll, when we will talk about solidarity and human rights, we will divide our talk in two parts. The first part will be dedicated to the um, development of the concept of the solidarity uh, in line with the concept of human rights at the international level, at the intergovernmental level, in interstate level, at the level of uh, international organizations. And the second part of our discussion will be connected to um, human rights solidarity and solidarity in general um, among human beings. So uh, like initiatives which were driving and by people uh, for people with people. So this will be like two parts of uh, our talk today. And uh, now I will start to talk at first about uh, international and intergovernmental and inter interstate institutions. After I finish this part, I, I would ask you to ask us questions, which you can pose in the chat. And Nazari will, uh, and Sasha will, uh, our translator will um, read them and I will answer them. Uh, and then we will start second part about uh, human dimension of solidarity, of international solidarity. And then we will also take several questions. Okay, I see more people from Kharkiv, Zaporizhia, Tbilisi, etc. So very nice, very encouraging. So without further ado, I will start with uh, the first dimension. Uh, so again, uh, when we talk about the concept of human rights, we talk about um, the concept with several uh, characteristics, uh, which are peculiar to human rights. Uh, one of them is uh, the fact that human rights, uh, it, this is relationships, uh, like the human rights concept lays in the relationships between individual and state. So, for example, uh, when we can hear sometimes that, um, I don't know, you are violating my right, one individual says to another individual, uh, this is this is a, not this kind of a, a everyday talk, but it's not the real reflection of the concept of human rights, because uh, uh, these relationships are happening only between state and individual. When uh, in ancient times, uh, state uh, becomes to um, a price, uh, when people decided to delegate some of their powers uh, to create institutions in order to maintain a public order, they maintain some part of the um, power to these institutions uh, to, to judge, uh, to punish, uh, to um, uh, rule some of the public affairs. Uh, and uh, in order to, to achieve this result, in order to to create a state which can take care of its own citizens, uh, the, the, in, in the ancient and historical times, people delegated some of their own powers to this new institution in order to avoid chaos, in order to avoid, uh, avoid war of everybody against everybody. And so that's how state was created. So state initially, uh, let's say, soaked out violence from the uh, from the community so when during the ancient time 
everybody was against everybody and there was a lot a lot of violence in the society in the community then community decided that we should have somebody in power and uh, somebody needs to uh, represent us and we will need to delegate our view but also some of our powers to this new institution that's how state was created and of course a state since then during the uh, all these years and during all these centuries is still is the main um, actor uh, to um, how to say uh, to uh, the main actor to bring the public order, but also to use violence, uh, uh, legitimate violence in order to, for example, um, limit crime or limit uh, illegal activities. But this process cannot be uh, completely, completely out of control, and it should be controlled by some limitations, but by some leverages uh, in order to avoid misuse of power. And human rights as a concept uh, were created uh, to prevent this misuse of power. In order to know more about the evolution of the concept of human rights and how they existed and how they have been created, you can have a look at, uh, at some of our old webinars, as Nazari said in the beginning, at our YouTube page. Um, but what I want to say, I want to say that human rights are kind of a uh, um, pre instrument to prevent misuse of power by state. That's why uh, this is a very important and very um, inherent and very uh, crucial element of the human civilization. Uh, and um, uh, as far as human rights, one of uh, its uh, concept, one of its main characteristics of its concept is universality. It means that you cannot achieve um, observance of human rights only in one society or only in one community or only in one city. Yeah. For example, if we have a uh, state and uh, uh, in the capital city, everything is more or less OK because uh, authorities are afraid of the protests and authorities are afraid that people will protest against the violations of human rights. But in the remote areas, they are doing whatever they want. Uh, it doesn't mean that, uh, it, it, sorry, it means that the observance of human rights is not achieved in this country. The same, if the human rights are um, drastically violated uh, in Ukraine, it means that all over the world, this human rights are violated, yeah? If human rights drastically violated in Syria or in um, Yemen, it means that all over the world, the human rights are not fully observed because human rights are universal and each human rights should be observed for each individual. Without this principle, uh, we cannot talk about the full observance of human rights. And uh, as, as far as I said before, taking into account that human rights concept appears only in the vertical relationships between individual and state as a, as a protective mechanism, it, it means that uh, as much we promote human rights as universal protective mechanism all over the world, as much we feel more protective. Because uh, as we gather together and learn from each other, states uh, and state authorities are also gathering together and learn from each other. And they take examples of the restrictive laws from each other. And they, um, they take examples of the restrictive actions and activities from each other. And that's why it's very important uh, that uh, we are trying to ensure that uh, human rights situation will not be uh, drastically decreasing in um, this or that part of the world, in this or that part of the region, in this or, or that part of the country. Because in this case, it means that we all are um, under the threat of uh, growing human rights violations. Um, uh, it reminds me a bit of um, a recent discussion uh, which was taking place and is taking place unfortunately in Europe, in European countries and the countries of European Union, uh, whether or not we still need to uh, somehow, um, as they say, release tensions, uh, save face of Putin, whether we need to try to bring Ukraine to peace, as they say, in order not to escalate the farther conflict. 
but the problem is here and the same it's in, with the situation in human rights. The more we try to um, avoid uh, understanding and awareness uh, of human rights violations all over the world, the more we think that if human rights violations happened in Syria or Yemen and it would not touch me, the more it will happen to us in the future. Because also for me, for example, I'm Ukrainian citizen, yes? And um, if I would not work with the region, with the region of post-Soviet uh, um, area, I even would not know what is happening in Kyrgyzstan or Tajikistan or in conflict between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan or in Turkmenistan. Also very far from me was, for example, Syria. But now when uh, I'm comparing, comparing a lot of things which happened in Syria and which are happening now in Ukraine, I can see the patterns, yes? Or for example, Ukraine and Georgia. In 2008, Georgia was actually left alone uh, by a lot of European and uh, Western governments in their uh, confrontation and fighting for own independence with Russia. And that's why again happened uh, situations in 2014 in Ukraine and in now in 2022, we're almost facing the global um, war and we are facing the drastic human rights violations. We are facing uh, something which is very close to the um, awful and uh, awful genocides of the past, such as uh, Armenian genocide, such as uh, Holocaust, such as uh, other genocides. Uh, and now also another uh, threat is added to all of this. It's threat of famine, of global famine, which might happen all over the globe because, again, we were not really sensitive to what was, to what was happening in other parts of the world. Uh, so this is about interconnection of trends which are happening on at the global scale. But now let's return and focus on how the concept of solidarity is reflected in the uh, international system on protection of human rights. Now I want to ask you a question. Feel free to write uh, in, in the chat. How do you think when human civilization begins? What was the event when human civilization has begun? Was it usage of fire? Was it usage of metal? What was it? How do you think? What was the moment when civilization began? Any thoughts in the chat? Thank you, Mikhail. This is a great and right answer. Really, it happened so. Uh, when one human started to care about the other, when, uh, um, and uh, it, it was the concept developed by one of the professors of anthropology from US. And she said, she asked the same question to her students. And there was a lot of ideas. And some people said, um, oh, civilization started when people started to uh, live together. Somebody said civilization started when people start to build homes. And somebody said civilization started when people started to use the fire or clay or metal or wood. Somebody said civilization started when people sta started to work, yes, to use labor. But uh, she said that in her opinion, civilization, civilization I'm sorry, starts when uh, we found body in some old grave, in some ancient grave, and uh, we can see that some of the bones of this individual during life were rounded and then healed. Which means that when somebody, for example, were chasing a mammoth and fall down and broke his leg or her leg, uh, other people didn't run away and didn't leave this person. But as Mikhailo said, started to take care about this individual and started to heal this individual. So human civilization in, anthrop anthrop in anthropological uh, understanding starts from the moment uh, when one person, one human being starts to care about other. And this is the very ancient source 
very ancient ground, very ancient um, uh, root of our uh, human solidarity. Uh, then, of course, the solidarity was developing during different historical periods, and we can find uh, different expressions of it in ancient times, in, even during the uh, dark times of um, medieval ages, uh, and uh, also creation of medicine uh, uh, as a uh, uh, field of human uh, science and human activities. Uh, when some people are learning something to heal other people, it's also a very strong manifestation of solidarity. Uh, art, uh, which is um, describing not only personal uh, feelings and personal suffering of uh, this or that artist, but also um, the, a lot of artists are describing the suffering and the intentions and aspirations of other people, um, especially people who are in less favorable conditions than them. Yes, of poor people, of uh, oppressed people. So this is also a form of solidarity. And as some as education is teaching how to uh, or to, how to um, be uh, how to, find your, how to find yourself in your life. This is also a form of solidarity. So all these uh, uh, small steps of the humankind towards solidarity they were happening during the all stages of uh, historical development of human being. Uh, and even the first event uh, and the first um, document which is mentioned by the human rights scholars is a source of, uh, as a first formal source uh, of legislation, first formal piece of legislation on human rights. It also was manifestation of solidarity. By the way, who knows what was the first document uh, which uh, contained the formal piece of legislation on human rights? Any ideas in the chat? The first document which consisted the formal piece of legislation on human rights. Mikhailo, uh, you are right again. Um, uh, uh, Akibek says that this is Hammurabi still, but Hammurabi still was containing some of the limitations containing the um, punishment, criminal punishment, but the first uh, source of uh, um, formal piece of legislation on human rights, which was confining the uh, powers of state uh, in relation to individual was really Magna Carta. And Magna Carta, it was uh, only adopted because of solidarity of barons in the medieval England who forced the king to adopt this Magna Carta. Because Hammurabi itself, it was uh, containing limitations in relationships between individuals, that one individual should not kill another individual uh, without uh, some regulations. Um, but in case with Magna Carta or Velika Hartia Volnoste, uh, right, Lidmito, uh, this was the uh, leverage to protect people uh, from uh, the, the king, from the power. So, never, uh, so during all these stages of human development of the human history, uh, up until to the First World War, the uh, concept of human rights was always expressed in, uh, in connection and in deep relations with solidarity, first, first of all of international solidarity. Uh, so when um, the, um, after the First World War, the League of Nations have been created, uh, uh, sorry, before, I'm sorry, uh, was created. Uh, it was the first uh, example of how states decided, decided to gather together in order to decide some kind of interstate and international um, relations. And uh, they were, but they were discussing more of diplomatic relations in between of them mainly conflict between states. And there was kind of a rule in the League of Nations that uh, one state can intervene in the affairs of another state in the internal affairs. So they were saying that we need to control your external aggression if you want to be aggressive against your neighbor, for example, but we are not going to intervene in the 
uh, your activities inside the country uh, and we are not going to pay attention to what you are doing to your citizens so uh, this first example of interstate uh, cooperation it completely tried to vanish the issue of human rights and international solidarity in the issues of human rights because they said that the main thing is that you obey the uh, uh, borders of your neighboring countries and you are not doing aggressive work and we don't care what is happening in your own country if you kill somebody if you hang somebody if you torture somebody we are not against it and uh, this is proved very uh, very on um, on um, um, how to say um incorrect in relation to what happened the, uh, during the World War II and before it, yeah? So uh, taking into account that League of, uh, League of Nations could not uh, pay any attention to what Hitler was doing inside of uh, uh, Germany. Later, they also lose control of what he was doing against, uh, against his neighbors, such as Czech Republic, Poland, uh, together with USSR, et cetera. So when the new human rights, uh, international human rights system in its classical way apprised uh, after the Second World War, when the, uh, when the, uh, mm, the classical uh, system of international human rights protection uh, by UN, which we use now was created, um, when UN was created itself, and when the first, um, the like, um, main messages on uh, international human rights protection have been stated in the UN Charter and have been stated in the uh, later in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and later in two pacts, uh, two covenants on uh, uh, on political and civic rights and on uh, social, economic, and cultural rights. So when the Bill of Rights, or so-called Bill of Rights adopted in the UN system have been created uh, already, it was um, obvious uh, to its creators that uh, this system should be based on the principle of international solidarity. That in order to avoid the tragedies such as Second World War and such as Holocaust and such as Roma genocide and such as a creation of concentration camps, and some other uh, awful crimes against humanity and against human rights during the World War II, the new system of uh, protection of human rights should be based on the principle of solidarity and on the right of other states to intervene into what you do if you are violating human rights inside your country and also inside your neighboring countries. So this was the idea which brought into life the uh, UN Statute, Universal Declaration on Human Rights, uh, and some other UN documents. Then in the 50s, the European, not only European, but regional mechanisms for human rights protection and international solidarity have arised. It was for European continent, it was European, uh, at first, uh, uh, European Council, which gave birth to uh, European Convention uh, for Human Rights. And this was the document which, first of all, established such a high standard all over the Europe that we don't have a death penalty. And secondly, it created the uh, interstate mechanisms um, uh, to uh, monitor the observance of this human rights. In, inside the end, there are also monitors, uh, monitoring bodies for observance of this human rights. But European system allowed concrete individual or groups of individuals to apply to the European Court for Human Rights to protect themselves from the uh, um, own state or states at the territories of which they were. Uh, they were, uh, and this was a very big step forward in the, uh, in, the, um, in the existence and development of the international system for human rights protection, again, based on solidarity, because uh, it, it meant that the um, uh, value of individual, um, the uh, value of individual life and the value of uh, human being, each human being should be protected in Europe by the solidarity will of all states who are united in this uh, framework. Unfortunately, 
the uh, horrors of the Second World War started gradually to fade. Uh, fortunately, or unfortunately, there was a big economic development. Then in the 60s, you remember, there was this big um, uh, revolution, students' revolution, sexual revolution, music revolution. About them, we will talk in the second part of our conversation when we will talk about uh, the um, international uh, solidarity movements at the human level. Uh, then 70s, uh, very quick economic development. And 70s and beginning of 80s, um, they, they already like, uh, they showed a bit of fading of international solidarity, but then it was revived again in the end of 80s and beginning of 90s, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, the fall of the uh, Soviet Union, the hope for the new future, the uh, this hope is, is was very well described in the famous um, song by Scorpions, "Follow the Moskva," uh, which now is, by the way, you know, it, they, they changed the lyrics after what happened in Ukraine this year. But I mean, it was also the second period of the big hopes. So it goes like like this: in in the forties, we had a very high human rights standard and standard in solidarity. Uh, and 50s also a bit, then again, everybody is thinking only about all the economic interests and real politics, then again, a big hope and a big appraisal in uh, solidarity and uh, international human rights protection, and then again, the big, um, big rabbit hole, which was open in 2000, in, in, in 2000, uh, 2000, from 2000 to 2010, and that was the point when this big concept of real politics was um, formulated in, in the international diplomacy, international law, international policies, and uh, inter in governments, especially rich governments, uh, uh, they <coughs> said that, you know, our interests. We also. Apologize for this uh, technical issues but it's online uh, event you know i think from your experience that sometimes it's happened very sorry yeah, and, uh... yes uh yes we use this time to i'm very sorry as soon as internet in my office mm -hmm. so i hope all good now. yes sasha we hear you Okay, sorry, sorry. I, I, I'm joking. All good, all good. I just invite people to prepare their questions and like share some comments. Yeah, I'm very sorry. Uh, as, as, as soon as I start to talk about real politics, uh, the internet went off. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, and unfortunately, in um, during years 2000, 2010, it was a real peak of real politics when the wealthy government started to say that um, we are not interested in, in, in what's happening in other countries and we are not going to be the guarantees uh, and uh, we are not going to provide uh, some guarantees and some instruments uh, for uh, solidarity work in other countries and we are not going to bring to uh, responsibility perpetrates, perpetrates, perpetrators of human rights violations because we, we are very, very uh, busy with our own issues. So that's how it worked. And also during the time between 2010 and 2020, we could observe it in 2008 in Georgia. As I said before, when Georgia was almost left alone in um, its uh, confrontation with Russia, we could have observed it in, um, if, if we are talking about our region only. Uh, then 2014, when uh, Ukraine was um, also uh, did, was not supported and abandoned to the certain grade, which caused the adoption of the um, this disgraceful this, this uh, Minsk, Minsk um, agreements. Uh, and now we are facing altogether consequences of what happened during these years. Uh, and now we can see that the international solidarity concept is returning 
uh, to the political agenda of our region, to the political agenda of the European continent, to the political agenda of the UN, and um, uh, international authorities are starting are starting to talk again uh, about uh, support to Ukraine, about support to other nations who are under threat and who are bordering with uh, Russian Federation. They are starting to talk about global famine and support to each other. They're starting to talk again about humanitarian aid. They are starting to talk how to give up their big business and their, um, how to get off oil uh, and uh, gas dependence from Russia and some other dictatorship countries in the Gulf. Uh, so again, we have this cycle of um, the um, um, current uh, political uh, and military events and amount of um, human uh, suffering and the amount of victims uh, causes the governments uh, to again return to the concept of solidarity. So it's it's like a, a, this kind of movement, yes, from the peak to the uh, rabbit hole, from the peak to the rabbit hole. But of course, uh, such um, the presence of such dynamics shows us that uh, the current system for international protection of human rights is not, um, how to say, is not uh, efficient and it should be reformed if we want in the future uh, prevent some other uh, situations like this. Uh, because uh, situation built on the principles of real politics, um, which seem to some um, governments to be really efficient and really sustainable, proves itself not to be sustainable. And systems built on solidarity uh, otherwise show their sustainability because, as I mentioned in the beginning of my speech, um, there cannot be situation where, where, when the uh, rights of one person is violated and the rights of other person is fully observed. Uh, it's very easy to become a minority. It's very easy to become, become a victim. And a lot of international conflicts and a, a lot of wars in our past and in our, in our uh, to, today's life shows us this. And I think that maybe we are the people who need to uh, advocate for the reform of the current system of international human rights protection and international solidarity at the state level. Um, here I will stop and you can, you can write your questions on this part about interstate issues in the chat. Uh, and uh, I will quickly switch off to my other internet because my colleagues are saying that the internet is back in the office. And during this, you can collect questions and I will answer them in like 20 seconds. Okay, I also can start with the second part and maybe questions and will come and we can uh, take them jointly in order not to spend a lot of time in vain. Uh, okay, so as I said, uh, there is dimension of international solidarity in the field of human rights, um, uh, which is, being at least declared, if not provided by the states. But there is also another dimension. For me, this dimension is more precious and more important. This is dimension of human solidarity. When uh, international movements of people have, have st became stronger and had better results than a lot of state institutions. We, we could see it in the past and we can observe it now. Uh, I will bring several examples uh, from the past and we'll come to today's day and to what is happening today. Uh, one of the uh, greatest examples of the, of the solidarity movement of the past is uh, anti-war uh, movement, which was formed around the um, war in Vietnam. And there was a, war, a lot of different, different, uh, uh, it was all over America and also it was joined by um, uh, activists all over the world in European countries and even in the USSR. Nevertheless, in USSR, it was a bit of uh, state sponsored, but anyway, it was happening. The whole world was horrified by what happened in Vietnam, by what uh, seemed to then, uh, uh, to then US administration as a small victorious war. So this concept of the small victorious war, it exists all over the 
human history, starting from Roma Empire, and it bothers the uh, failing uh, state leaders and dictators and uh, autocrats until now. And we can see it now, unfortunately, very tragically in Ukraine. So the same, the, the idea of the Vietnamese war for uh, then administration of uh, United States also was that they very quickly will come there, will sort the affairs, and it will not cause such disastrous results for, for uh, American society and for the whole world as it caused. So, and, but also uh, if we can talk about some positive events in relation to it, it caused a very, very strong uh, anti-war movement, and it actually gave a birth to the hippie movement which was a part of the peace movement during the next uh, uh, same, uh, dozens of years and next um, and exist until now. Uh, so there was a lot of different uh, activities uh, in, in the different uh, layers of American society, first of all. Uh, there was, for example, some formal movements uh, when um, uh, scientists who were studying Asian, Asian uh, affairs in, in, in United States, they started to protest and they started to write the letters and they started to explain that relationships and civil war in Vietnam is much more complicated than what is presented by US administration. There was some uh, um, protest of some diplomats who was uh, at the service at that time, and they said that they don't want to be diplomats anymore because uh, they see how this war is aggressive, is unfair, and is undermining US society, first of all, and not only creating uh, awful uh, war, war crimes in, in Vietnam. Uh, there were also youth movements, uh, such as make the very famous one, make love, not war, which we all know. Yeah, uh, and it, this slogan was first of, first uh, 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 proclaimed by John Lennon in his uh, uh, song Mind Games, uh, and then it was uh, took undertook undertaken by um, uh, Gershon Legman, the one of the leaders of the anti-war protest in 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 US during the Vietnam War. And uh, it was then used widely in the pop culture, in the protests, in the, for the movement of young people. Related to this make love not war, uh, you know the very famous um, protest, uh, which was, uh, which was uh, started by, uh, uh, it, it not started, but it's the most famous manifest, manifestation of such, such protest is uh, John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Uh, when they were in Amsterdam, just after their wedding, they were in bed uh, in their honeymoon suite, and they invited uh, uh, journalists to film them, and they were saying that uh, bed in for peace. Uh, and they were um, uh, summoning people uh, to the bad protest or bad in protest uh, all over the world to, to show as a kind of uh, uh, strike to show their form of um, uh, protest against the uh, police politics and policy of um, the uh, United States in uh, Vietnam. Uh, then it caused other other bad in protests by, by a lot of young people who were inspired by John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Unfortunately, we don't see a lot of uh, pictures from these protests except uh, of picture of by John Lennon and Yoko Ono because there were no smartphones at that time. I, I think that if now such protests would be announced, a lot of people uh, would take part in it. Uh, there was there was also some other very interesting protests. For example, uh, the uh, unofficial tribunal organized by British um, public figure Bertrand Russell, together with French public figure Jean Paul Sartre, uh, to carry out the public tribunal against the crimes of uh, against the war crimes uh, of uh, both uh, of all sides. Uh, U.S. side, uh, Vietnam side, and other sides in Vietnam War. 
So it was kind of, uh, they were saying that we want, uh, we, don't, we, we cannot uh, like repeat the Nuremberg Tribunal, but we also think that we need to condemn the war crimes and we need to show solidarity to the people of Vietnam and to the, uh, to the young people from USA who are sent there to, be, to, to, to die, to fight and to die. And we need not to judge, but we need to witness of what was caused by war in Vietnam in order it would not uh, happen again in the future. Uh, there uh, was also a lot of other activities, flowers better than, better than bullets. Uh, they were the, the famous protest of uh, Chicago 7 about which you, you saw the movie perhaps, and uh, if, if somebody didn't see you, you should, you should because it's very nice movie. Um, and some uh, Hanoi and Jane protests and some other protests uh, which, which were caused by the war in, in Vietnam. But what was uh, very peculiar to this in connection to this issue of solidarity is that um, it started in the USA and then it happened also in, in Great Britain, in uh, France, all over Europe, and it was connected to the overall movement of student revolutions, of the sexual revolution, of emancipation, of uh, creation and strengthening of hippie movement, of feminist movement, of LGBTIQ movement. So this was, was kind of a very big solidarity wave, which was started by single events, but then it was uh, mm, strengthened by uh, different causes all around the region and all around the world. Another protest which I wanted to mention is the protest against the war in Iraq. Uh, it, it happened uh, in 2003 uh, uh, and some people still consider this a moment when the, the first big uh, not attack, but first big uh, damage was brought to the uh, current modern system of international law uh, when uh, the uh, real politic won over the democratic principles and solidarity and principles of the international law. And the uh, decision was taken to, um, uh, to, to start the war in Iraq with no regard to the fact that Saddam Hussein is real and awful dictator, was real and awful dictator, who was torturing people himself, who committed genocide of the Kurdish people, who committed genocide of uh, uh, other ethnic minorities in Iraq, and who really uh, was worth a big trial and really was worth uh, uh, punishment. The, uh, how the reasoning for this um, war in Iraq was formula formulated, how the public opinion was not taken into account, uh, how some of the formal procedures of international law have been um, not taken into account, all this caused the protests. And uh, now the time shows that uh, the protests were completely right and legitimate, because until now, for example, uh, the war criminal regime of Russia, war criminal Putin, Putin regime, is still saying if uh, the, so you call it democratic countries, these democratic countries, they invaded Iraq in 2003, why can, cannot I now uh, invade some other countries? So this, the damage to the internal, international law system in one place is giving the precondition to damage to the international law system in another place. That's what we, talk what we call universal, universality of human rights, universality of international law, and universality of solidarity. If it leaks in one place, it will definitely leak in another. So in uh, February 2003, there was the very big solidarity protest, uh, which is uh, uh, mentioned in the, also in the uh, Guinness uh, Book of Records. Uh, and uh, it, it happened from uh, 15 to 16 of February 2003 uh, in 60 countries. And uh, the amount of people who simultaneously, I underline this, simultaneously took place, took part in the demonstrations were 30 millions of people, 30 millions. And this, is, this was completely decentralized protest which took place all over the world. And it was the first decentralized protest organized 
over the uh, internet. So this is also a very big and good example of international coordination. Uh, and uh, also very nice to say that one of the providers of, of this international coordinations uh, was uh, the uh, universities all over the world. And also one of the centers for this coordination were World Social Forum in Porto Alegre in Brazil, where I had the honor to be and where I had had an honor to be one of the simultaneous translators. So Sasha, sorry if I'm talking too fast. Uh, and I was trans I, I had an honor to translate Federico Mayor from English to Spanish. Um, this is also a very uh, interesting composition, a very interesting event, World, World Social Forum, uh, where you have organizational committee and uh, they select the place and they organize some local facilities and then they invite people and people start to share their resources also with local people to organize everything else. So for example, all the accommodations during the event, all the food is organized by local communities, but people who are coming, they themselves organize the tickets or for example, themselves work for the forum, for example, as we were uh, free of charge uh, um, uh, simultaneous translators. So this was a very great event and a very great experience of, uh, and I'm very proud that I was part of this that time. So this was one of the biggest, and I think it's still one of the biggest events in the world. Let's see, maybe now Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian solidarity actions would beat this record. But I, I will remind you that in 2003, develop, development of internet was not as much as now. And so this was a very, very big event. Unfortunately, it would not really uh, influence the real politics and the uh, intentions of the anti-Iraqi coalition at that time. And what happened, happened. But even un uh, unsuccessful manifestation of solidarity is already successful because it also brings comfort and support to the people who might be victims of oppression and human rights violations. Another big example which I want to bring is uh, when um, UN, this is why I want to bring this example because it was mixed, it was cooperation between UN and uh, citizens. When uh, UN made a call uh, to collect money for uh, Syrian refugees uh, for 24 million of uh, women, children, and men, uh, and uh, uh, they were hoping that they can collect money uh, through the joint conference between U and UN on Syria. And uh, why, uh, while they were waiting for um, this conference, uh, people started to collect money and uh, they collected uh, several millions of support to the Syrian refugees. Uh, so this is also a very nice event of how solidarity can be administrated together by international organizations, authorities, and civil society. Um, before we take questions, I want to return a bit to our region and say about uh, several very problematic countries in our region where we uh, organize solidarity actions, also together with Nazari, who is here, with Sasha. Uh, for example, uh, Art for Democracy in Azerbaijan in 2012. In 2012, there was a great crackdown on human rights uh, and civil society in Azerbaijan. And uh, one of the local organizations, they started campaign art for democracy because they know they knew that in uh, 2012, there will be a um, new revision contest in Azerbaijan. And they decided to use it as a solidarity event and as a mean of uh, attracting attention of the world to situation in Azerbaijan. And uh, they started to develop different uh, songs and artworks and different uh, of, of the local uh, of the local as Az Az Azerbaijani artists uh, who have been presenting it, uh, uh, describing the situation with human rights in, in Azerbaijan, and they also started to work with participants of Eurovision from different uh, 
democratic countries and one of them it was a singer Lorraine Loren from Sweden she agreed she knew that she would violate the rights of uh, Eurovision she was a winner of Eurovision uh, she uh, after her final song uh, she made a statement about human rights in Azerbaijan unlike the situation with Kalush Orchestra this year uh, she, she, she was not forgiven for this it was considered con considered as violation of the rules of uh, Eurovision contest and uh, she was like uh, punished for this fined and disqualified but uh, this year when Kalos Orchestra made its statement made its statement about Azov uh, uh, it was considered to be uh, not political but humanitarian uh, humanitarian statement which also shows that even uh, such formats as Eurovision they also develop they also uh, can uh, adapt to the situation they also can absorb the information about what was going what is going on in the outer world and it's kind of sweet bitter pain from one hand I see that uh, I, I'm sure that this statement by Carlos Orchestra in during the Eurovision, it made a difference and it really, I think, was a part of a bigger advocacy in order to um, provide um, activities uh, to support uh, our uh, warriors at uh, Azov style. But uh, it's, it's very sad that uh, when it was question of the lives, also very precious individual lives of 20 or 30 human rights defenders in Azerbaijan, uh, the global community and Eurovision community didn't care about this. So global and international community needs a big amount of victims to be awakened, to understand that solidarity is needed. While if solidarity would be in place, starting from uh, that years, um, such tragedy which happened in Ukraine would, not, would never happen. Uh, that's why, unfortunately, in our world, Solidarity comes as a um, consequence of some disastrous events, while solidarity should be all the time in place in order to prevent these events. Thank you very much, and I'm open for the questions and remarks, maybe also remarks, not only questions. Thank you a lot, Sasha, for your presentation. Uh, uh, we already have uh, Two questions, mm -hmm. and I would like to uh, to ask you them. So, um, Oksana asked, uh, I will translate. Um, on your opinion, uh, can we assume that the United uh, Nation uh, Nation has not coped with its mission in the same way as the League of Nations did at one time? Uh, in this context, do you mean reforming uh, the system? Absolutely, absolutely. I, sh I should say that you, uh, UN failed, absolutely failed, because uh, for a long time, I remember I was uh, when I was in high school, and it was in the beginning of the thousands, uh, and uh, I was, uh, as many young people do, I was a part of uh, um, uh, UN model systems, you know, when uh, kids from high schools or universities, they gather together and they model the UN. And usually some officials from UN appear there. And usually you receive some kind of um, uh, imagined crisis, which you need to resolve during this UN model. And uh, already then, when I was a small um, teenager, not small, but teenager, I, uh, we, we all started to understand that UN system is already not working because even with uh, imagined crises, uh, it's, it was very hard to, to resolve them because of the, a lot of this bureaucratical leverages, bureaucratical limitations. Uh, and then when I started to work with international advocacy, I understood it uh, completely. And uh, I think all colleagues who are working with uh, international advocacy, international law, who, who is uh, educating uh, people, who educating students in the university on these topics, you all would agree with me that UN system is now also very, very, uh, how to say, it, it's not up to date because it was created after the Second World War when the world was polarized. And the idea was that everybody has a leverage uh, to 
protect own country. That's why we have this right of veto in, in the Security Council. And Security Council is only decisive body within the UN system. The only body who can recognize, for example, uh, some state as a sponsor of terrorism. For example, yeah, we all understand that Russia should be recognized now as a sponsor of terrorism, especially after what they did during all these months and yesterday completely outrageous attack on civilians in Kremenchuk, completely outrageous attack on civilians in Kramatorsk. So this is terroristic state. But in order to do it, you need decision of the uh, uh, UN Security Council. Uh, and UN Security Council, you, you, you have Russia there who have a right of veto. You want to say UN uh, peacemaking troops to some country? You need, I don't know, to, to Ukraine or to Georgia or to, I don't know, uh, to, to Syria. You need decision of Security Council. Russia sits there with its weather right, yeah? So it's, it's like a kind of vicious circle. And of course, UN cannot work in this kind of setting now. Mm. Uh, and yes, it, it reminds me situation of League of Nations. But then in the League of Nations, they thought they, they didn't want to intervene in the internal affairs of other states. Now UN wants to intervene, but doesn't know how to do it. And UN is not in the worst conditions because UN has a lot of different institutions. And at least if not the Security Council, other institutions, including International Court of Justice can be very useful because for example, also taking into account that Ukrainian government cannot do it in the Security Council. Now they have a, a case in the International Court of Justice of UN uh, in order to recognize finally Russia as a uh, terrorist, uh, terrorist state sponsoring terrorism. Uh, so you have a different options inside of UN. But for example, in OEC, you have no options. Also decisions are taken by consensus of all states, which completely paralyzed this organization and made it made it useless body. I hope I answered the question. Uh, I guess, yes, but we have one more question about mm -hmm. the nations, which may be kind of familiar, but uh, Mikhailo asked, um, are there only two options now for the United Nations to reform itself by the decision of the General Assembly, either to be dissolved and create immediately uh, another organization without Russia, or to be expelled uh, Russian from the United Nations on the ground that this state was never taken in this organization? Very good, very good point. Uh, I will ask, I will answer this question uh, on two levels. Uh, so the first, first of all, yes, I agree that you, UN should better reform itself or, or, or dissolve because, uh, and, and this, this will also soon happen with OECE because Council of Europe, it has uh, some practical impact because it has European uh, uh, Court of Human Rights, yes, it has, uh, it has some economical pro uh, programs of cooperation, educational programs of cooperation. It has programs of cooperation in the social sphere, uh, programs of cooperation in the prevention of domestic violence area, et cetera, et cetera. And the system of decision-making in the European, uh, in the Council, sorry, in the Council of Europe, with no regards that it's also very complicated, but uh, it, 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 it has more leverages for different states to uh, influence it. And you can see it because the Russian Federation is, uh, their membership was um, stopped. And uh, so you see that the international organization can be more or less efficient, but UN just didn't want to be efficient for many years because talks about reforms in the UN, they, as I said, they, start, they started uh, 20 years ago, and, but nobody wanted to do it because it was very nice to sit in New York, to sit in Geneva, to sit in some other nice places all over the world, and to have a very big buildings, very, very big structure, uh, and, and not to pay real attention to what is happening in, in, in globally. Uh, what? So uh, I think that, yes, now it's a crucial moment. Secondly, yes, I agree with you, Mikhaila, that uh, Russia was never adopted and never taken uh, to UN. Why? Uh, it sounds surprisingly for some people, but um, uh, when uh, United Nations have been created, there were several states who founded this organization. And among the founders was USSR. 
and also Ukrainian uh, Soviet Republic at that time and Belarus Soviet Republic at that time, together with other like uh, big countries such as uh, uh, England, uh, Britain, France, USA, China, etc. They uh, founded this organization. Why Ukraine and Belarus have been selected? It was kind of a political lobby of uh, USSR because they wanted more uh, voices, more votes. Uh, but the official reason was that uh, like these are two republics of USSR who sustained the most losses after the Second World War and in, 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 in which there was uh, the most amount of people per capita who died uh, uh, fighting the Nazis. But what happens when uh, USA is collapsing, yeah? USSR is collapsing. <laughs> um, like uh, there is Ukraine uh, who is already there, yeah? Because it's uh, the... Mm, it, it, it's a legal um, inheritance of uh, uh, USSR, uh, Ukrainian SSR, I'm sorry. And there is Belarus who also there because it's legal inheritance of Belarus uh, SSR, Soviet so Socialistic Republic. But there is also like USSR in general. Yes, Russia proclaimed that she is uh, kind of uh, legal inheritance of uh, USSR, but there was this certain list of activities in which it proclaimed itself a legal inheritance of USSR. So for example, when Czechoslovakia uh, fall apart, Czechia, Czech Republic and Slovakia, they were from the beginning taken into UN. When the uh, former Yugoslav Republic was dissolved, again, each party of it was taken into UN again. But Russia was the one guy, let's say, who just changed their tablet from USSR to Russia. And they did the same in the, uh, in the Security Council and illegally undertook the um, all rights in UN, uh, uh, violating the rights of all other Soviet republics who have been the part of USSR. Uh, so now this, this is a big, uh, from the legal point of view, it's a very big gig and it's very hard work. But I know that Ukrainian lawyers, uh, including lawyers from MFA, Ukrainian MFA, are working on this. And I'm person personally in favor that Russia should be at least expelled from Security Council on these grounds, that they were never taken to Security Council and they just changed the tablets. And it was the time when there was a big hope uh, for end of the Cold War and everybody wanted to be friends and nobody like put attention to this uh, in a friendly manner. And unfortunately it was a big mistake. Thank you, Sasha, for your answers. Uh, I, I think the next question- uh, uh, It's more like comment, Sergei, I guess. But yeah, for he I already, your comment, but I, th I think I also related to this comment already. Mm -hmm. Yes. And actually, it's time to finish uh, our webinar for today. So um, maybe I will have one more question, Sasha. It's like question. Uh, uh, for me, solidarity is very important. It, it's very important in my life. And um, I think solid solidarity action also inspire me for some other action to to do something more when I see solidarity from other people from other like countries etc. And I would like to ask you maybe you can recommend some uh, I don't know movie or book about solidarity. Uh, maybe something came to your uh, mind. Yeah, first of all, I agree with you. Solidarity is something which gives strength. In the most awful situations when you feel solidarity, this is very important. And for example, uh, like uh, you, uh, like day before, I'm now in Tbilisi, Georgia, and day before uh, there was a big concert of um, Okeanel during the Tbilisi Open Fest. And we saw a lot of, and when Okeanel was singing, a lot of local people from Georgia, they showed so much solidarity. And when uh, everybody was singing together with Akianelzi in Ukrainian and then Akianelzi, they sang the song in, in Georgian. Uh, or for example, when 
Bono or you know the ones that were singing in Ukrainians in Kiev subway, yeah. Or when we hear that people are collecting millions of dollars around the world for Ukraine, or when we can see as uh, we collected all together uh, bioreactors, yes, for uh, public bioreactors for Ukraine, and then this um, this facility who sells who sells them, uh, they say we will give them free of charge. And that, that is already the second case when people from uh, Lietuva collected uh, also money for the Bayraktar for, for people for, for Ukraine. It also was very touching. So solidarity is always very touching and very encouraging and gives you strength in the situations where you cannot you cannot breathe. But about the movie, I already said, I already mentioned today this movie about, I don't remember the exact movie about how it's called, but it's about the Chicago 7. So it's about the trial uh, over seven uh, protesters uh, during the open air festival in Chicago who were protesting against the war in Vietnam. And it's a very nice movie. Uh, and um, about the books, uh, I think that one of the best books uh, which I can uh, I can uh, recommend in, in 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 the regard of international and in, in general of solidarity and of uh, um, I think it's maybe it's a long shot but for me in general book about taking care uh, about own planet uh, it's the same author who wrote The Little Prince, but it's another book of him, uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, it's a planet of people, it's called, so, planet of humans in, in English, Planeta Людей, Ukrainian. And talking about like uh, Chicago, maybe it's uh, the trial of Chicago 7. Yes, yes, the, the, the trial of Chicago 7, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you're right, yes, yes, yes. And Planet of Humans by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Sasha, for your presentation. It was uh, amazing. Uh, I can tell, like always, <laughs> because it's not uh, our first webinar. Thank you a lot. Uh, and uh, it's time to finish uh, our webinar. So uh, I would like to say that evaluation form uh, for this webinar will send uh, to your emails, uh, which you mentioned when you uh, registered for this webinar and also this will all of um, us to make the future events even better and more useful for you so please fulfill uh, this form. I uh, would like to remind you that this uh, webinar is conducted by Human Rights Vector NGO Ukraine in partnership with the Board of um, Tolerance NGO Georgia and the Promolex NGO Moldova uh, in the framework of the in the in search for solidarity project with support from Human Rights House Foundation and funded by European Union. Thank uh, a lot for our partners and uh, our partners um, already prepared interesting webinars about human rights and solidarity in their countries. I remind you that this webinar will be. Uh, in Ukrainian, Georgian, and Romanian language, uh, and uh, you can join them even if you don't know this language, because uh, we will have uh, tra translation also on them. So feel free to join and just follow our uh, announcements. So uh, actually, it's all information for me. But uh, last slide, please. Uh, I would like to inform you also that we will have this like. Uh, uh, three topics of webinars in each country and then after we will have context about the local history of solidarity which we'll an announce later but uh, we're waiting you to, to to join this uh, contest also uh, we decided to create telegram chat uh, which you can join and you also have like link for this telegram chat after this event and uh, in this chat we can share like movies, uh, books, like your uh, examples, just uh, create some connections and maybe uh, we'll create some new projects or you between each other uh, and at the end of the project we will have uh, like common online meeting with participants, maybe our expert will, uh, experts will join us, so look forward to the, for this also.
and this opportunity of this project, uh, which I would like to share with you. Thank you a lot one more time and see you on next webinars in Ukrainian language <laughs> with me. Thank you for solidarity, guys. Thank you very much. Take care. Be safe. Goodbye.